Our Father, the scriptures tell us to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. to let our requests be made known unto you. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We have to think about the future. You uh, expect us to do that. But there is a difference, as it has been pointed out by There is a difference between legitimate forethought, thinking ahead, making plans, um, consulting, looking ahead. That's legitimate forethought. But then there is excessive worry. And those are two completely different things. It is so easy with the pressures that we have and the concerns, uh, the uncertainty of life, the, um, the times in which we live in, which are not real stable from our vantage point, it is easy to become anxious. And it's easy to become overcome. And to tie ourselves in a knot. But... You say to us in this room tonight that you don't want us anxious in the sense of being rattled or being shaken about what we can't control. Because you're in control. That makes all the difference in the world. You've got your eye on us. You know our situation. You know every detail. We, we know a lot of details about what worries us, but you know every detail. You, you know things we've never thought of. Yet, <laughs> you tell us not to be tied up with worry because you've got it. it this comes down to a question of whether or not we will trust you. When we are excessively anxious, we spend all of our energy uh, on, and, and it, does, it does no good. It's energy that is misspent. We, we come to this study tonight, and everyone seems fine. Everyone is... Uh, calm and gracious and we're greeting one another but there are some who are carrying uh, heavy, heavy burdens and uh, didn't sleep well last night and the prospect of sleeping well tonight is not good unless they get perspective so tonight we ask for perspective Remind us of what is true about you and who you are. Calm us down. Recalibrate our hearts. Help us to cast all of our care upon you because you care for us. And you can do something about that which we're concerned There are things we can do, but so often things are out of our hands. They're never out of your hands. So may a calm and may a peace come into our hearts as we um, ponder the truth about you and who you are and your love for us. Those whose minds are stayed on thee, thou will keep in perfect peace because they trust in thee. Isaiah 26, 3.
May that be our prayer tonight when we go home and get in our beds. And may we mold that over and over and over and we will soon fall asleep and we will rest. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are continuing our study on the Ten Commandments, and we, last week, commenced to study the Seventh Commandment, and we are still on it, and we will be on it for uh, some more weeks to come. The Seventh Commandment, you shall not commit adultery. It's in Exodus 2014. It is a, uh, as we said last week, when you study these commandments, uh, they, they, they're broad. Their application is broad because when God gives the commandment, you shall not commit adultery, in essence what he is doing is that he is protecting the institution of marriage. And marriage is the fundamental cornerstone of human society, the family is. God has the copyright, he has the trademark, he has the patent on marriage, he invented it, he owns it. And a bunch of graduates from certain law schools who buy some black robes may try to change it, but they can't. God owns marriage. The further you get away from God's word, the more chaotic the world and life becomes. Because we depart from his wisdom and we depart from common sense. It used to be that uh, people would give a compliment and they would say of someone, you know, he's, he's got a lot of common sense. What, what is common sense? It's just another way of saying he's got a lot of wisdom. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The awe of God, the reverence for God, the reverence for what he has said, who he is. But we are departing from that. We look at these commandments, oftentimes our culture does, and we see them as so restrictive and inhibiting our pursuit of happiness and pleasure and joy. Nothing could be further from the truth. T tonight, as we look at this commandment again, you shall not commit adultery. We made the statement last week that in our times and our culture, one of the primary paths, if not the primary path to adultery is pornography. And we discussed pornography some last week. I want to continue with that this week because it's such a huge problem. It's such a pervasive problem. It is uh, epidemic. You don't even have to pursue it. It will pursue you. On your phone, uh, it, it'll just, there'll be a link, there'll be an email, what's this? There'll be a text. You didn't ask for it. It's just pervasive. Tonight, I want to give you, uh, well, we're going to make two observations. The first observation is this, and this is our outline for tonight. Observation number one is the benefit of the commandment. The benefit of the commandment. And then, observation number two, we'll spend some time on the battlefield of this commandment. Because there is a battle to observe this commandment. I mentioned Exodus 2014, the Ten Commandments are given there. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Deuteronomy 5, because Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 5, God restated the Ten Commandments. Before he restated the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 4, 
verses 39 and 40, he talks about the benefit, the benefits of this commandment, of all the commandments. He says this in 39 of chapter 4 of Deuteronomy, Know therefore today and take it to your heart that the Lord, he is God in heaven above and on the earth below, and there is no other. So you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I am giving you today, watch this, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may live long on the land which the Lord your God has given you for all time. Uh, the consensus in our culture is, is that God is the cosmic killjoy. He, he is the one that's always getting in the way of our uh, pursuit of happiness and pleasure. Uh, he's so restrictive. He's just so strict. I, I can remember one of my sons saying to me in his teen years, you know, Dad, you're just so strict. You're just so strict. And I said, yeah. And when you're a dad, you're going to be a lot worse than I am. Because it's going to be a lot worse when you're raising kids. It's not that you're trying to ruin your lives. It's that you're trying to save their lives. Uh, Proverbs 16 is, I think it's verse 9. The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. In our immaturity, we make our plans and we think we know what's best for our lives. In the goodness of God, he will interrupt our plans. In the goodness of God, he will um, disappoint our plans. And as John Newton says, when God has done that in his life, as time went by, he would look back and realize that was a mercy from God. Because if you go further down in Psalm 6, uh, Proverbs 16, I'm doing this off the top of my head, somewhere around verse 25, it says, there is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. In our immaturity, a lot of our plans, which we want and desire, and we think would be so wonderful, actually would be a destruction to us. So God in his mercy interrupts. But if he interrupts, if he disappoints, it's because he always has something better. His commandments are better. They're not only better for us, he says, so that I'm giving you these commandments so that it may go well with you. I want you to, I, I want you to have a good life. I, I want you to um, have joy. I want you to have peace. I, I want you to have favor in your relationships. Not that we don't have our struggles and our hardships, because we do. But when we, fo when we follow his commands... They're for our good, and they're for the good of our children. There, I'm aware of a young man who, um, young father, the young family, that just recently has tried to uh, end his life. And he's in intensive care, and it remains to be seen what's going to happen. Now, this is a tragedy, obviously. It's a great tragedy. He really came to know the Lord several years ago, but has just had one difficulty after another, after another, after another. The, the reason, the root reason that he tried to take his life is that this commandment, you shall not commit adultery, was violated. It wasn't violated by him. It was violated by his father when he was maybe nine, ten years old. His father knew the scriptures well. Uh, was 
in one of the top seminaries in the world was right at the top of his class. Years went by, married, had children. At a certain point, came in and announced to this young man and his mother and his siblings that he was leaving them. He had found someone else. And that was it. He was gone. He was out of there. And this young man, now in his early 30s, that happened some 20, 22, 24 years ago. It killed him. It absolutely killed him and his siblings. He's never recovered. It was a breach of trust. It um, devastated him because now his father was physically absent and emotionally absent. And in those adolescent years when he needed his father, his father was not there. He, he told me the day his father made that announcement, his life has been hell ever since. Now, what, what was it that occurred? His father, who knew the scriptures, decided that he would disobey this commandment, you shall not commit adultery. You never sin alone, ever. We never sin by ourselves. Our sin, my sin, your sin, always affects somebody else. Always. It's okay as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. The problem is it always hurts somebody else, doesn't it? Always. So this commandment was given. God says very clearly, I'm giving you this commandment today so that it may go well with you and with your children after you. What are the ramifications when we disobey? It doesn't go well with us, and for the father, it hasn't gone well with him. That particular relationship, that didn't last long. So then there's another one that follows, that doesn't last long. You know the story, you know how that works. It didn't go well with him and this young man's mother, it hasn't gone well with her. And the siblings, it's heartbreaking. The previous commandment says, thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not kill. The idea is thou shalt not murder. That little family was murdered when that decision was made because we never sin alone. And, and honestly, that's at the core of this young man's despair. I heard him say a year ago that he wanted more than anything else to be a godly father. It was really his heart's desire. He's met the Lord. Truly, I think he met the Lord. You say, well, then why did he take his own life? Well, I don't know every detail. I, I have observed, I would say, over the last seven, eight years, six, seven, eight men knew the Lord, some of them in this study, who took their own lives. 
Whenever that happens, a man gets isolated because you can't live the Christian life by yourself. You can't do it. Uh, Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. When you get isolated, you're in trouble. That's how wolves pick off, you know, you got a group of elk or deer, they'll pick one off, they'll isolate it, they'll cull it out. You know that. The enemy does the same thing with us. You get out of the word, you get overwhelmed, you begin to lose all hope, you lose perspective. Whenever there's suicide, there is demonic oppression because Satan is the father of lies. He's the father of liars, and he is a murderer from the beginning. So it's a loss of all perspective. Now, the Bible says you shall not murder. You shall not self-murder. If someone really knows the Lord and they die by their own hand, as I read the scriptures, they go to be with the Lord because when Jesus went to the cross, Jesus paid for every sin. Every sin. When Jesus was on the cross, he paid for my sin, past, present, and future. Now, that was 2,000 years ago. So, we didn't even exist. But he took my sin, he took your sin, and his last words on the cross were, it is finished, to telestai, which can also be translated paid in full, Jesus paid it all. He paid for all my sin. Uh, this young man is still hanging on. Uh, he's in the Lord's hands. But the root of this is thou shalt not commit adultery. I bring this up because in a room with this many men, undoubtedly there's someone in here that is considering breaking this commandment. You don't want to do that. Years ago, I wrote a book called Finishing Strong, and in there, I included three little principles that are, not, they're, they're, they're short, but they're significant, that are not original with me about sin. And my problem is, tonight, I can only remember two out of the three. Now, it's well known, maybe one of you guys can help me. The first one is this. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. I just want to have a tryst, just want to have a little affair. Well, it's going to wind up taking you farther than you want to go. Secondly, sin will cost you more than you want to pay. And third, it will keep, thank you, it will keep you longer than you want it to stay. It's never just a one night stand. There will be residual effects and consequences. So God tells us, I got a better way. This is serious stuff. This is life and death stuff. This is generational stuff. What I do as a father, what I do as a grandfather, affects my children and it affects my grandchildren. Same for you. So we cannot forget the benefit of the commandment. You never lose when you do it God's way. It may look like you're losing. 
but you never lose. The eyes of the Lord roam to and fro about the earth, looking for those whose hearts are fully his, that he may strongly support them. When it comes to this commandment, you want to be a Joseph and not a David. If you remember, David, uh, let's start with Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery at the age of 17, was bought by a man named Potiphar, was at the, this man had a great, great estate, and I mean, his life was essentially over, except the hand of God was on him. He was probably starting out cleaning the latrines, and, but he was faithful, and the Lord was with him, and the Lord began to promote him as, he who is faithful in little will be faithful in much. And it was amazing because Potiphar noticed him, his owner, and essentially put him in charge of his entire estate. This was a working estate. This was a big, working Texas ranch. This was a king ranch situation. This wasn't a, uh, this wasn't a condo. This man, Potiphar, was a high-ranking official, official in uh, Pharaoh's cabinet. So he had a lot of holdings, he had a lot of slaves, he had a lot of servants, and he put Joseph in charge of everything, and he didn't concern himself with anything except whether or not he was going to have salmon that night or prime rib. If you read the scriptures, that's exactly what it says. (laughs) Turn with me, if you would, to Genesis Thirty-nine, And if you look at verse 6, so he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge, that's Potiphar, and with him there he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. You know, he's a young guy, he's in his late 20s. You know, he works out six days a week, three days cardio, three days weights. I mean, you know, he's on the keto diet. This guy's in shape. He's handsome in form and appearance. So he's just had a tremendous promotion from God. Was a slave doing the toilets. Now he's running the whole estate. I mean, he's got a credit card. I mean, he's probably got a platinum card. He's got a a Mercedes chariot. He's probably got a condo on the Nile. I mean, he's doing well. Never expected this. Watch this. It came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph, and she said, lie with me. And he said, sure, why not? I'll go ahead and then ask for forgiveness later. He didn't say that. Look at this. But he refused. He refused. And said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here, my master doesn't concern himself with anything in the house. He has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I. He has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? You see, we've talked about what happens when we sin. We never sin alone. It affects relationships. Uh, You commit adultery, it affects a wife, kids. Right, we've seen that. But you see, the ultimate deal is, is right here. How could I do this great, great evil and sin against God? Who has been so good to me, who has been so merciful to me, who has saved me, who has given me the truth, who has raised me up, who has given me hope and a future and a life and gives me breath How can I do this great evil and sin against God? And she said, okay, and she went away and never bothered him again. Next verse, and as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. She didn't go away. 
Sexual temptation never goes away. Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the household was there. Inside, she caught him by his garment, said, Lie with me. He left his garment in her hand and fled. He left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled, she called to the men of the household and said to them, See, he has brought in a Hebrew, Joseph, to make us to make sport of us. A Hebrew to us to make sport of us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I screamed. She's saying, Joseph tried to rape me. When he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment and fled and went outside. So she left his garment beside her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with these words, the Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came in to make sport of me. I raised my voice and screamed. He left his garment, fled outside. Now when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him saying, this is what he did to me, his anger burned. Joseph's master took him, put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the jail. You say, well, Steve, wait a minute. See, see, this is, see, yeah, here you go. So the guy did what was right, and he winds up in jail. How is that a good God? Look at the next verse. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness and gave him favor inside of the chief jailer. Now watch this. Yeah, he's back in jail. Boy, that's a great disappointment. But God didn't leave him. God's still with him. God was watching him. God was watching his heart to see what he was going to do. This is called a test. It's a test. Joseph refused to do what was wrong and disobey the Lord. Yeah, he's in jail, but watch what happens next. The chief jailer, uh, uh, well, it says it in 21, the Lord was with Joseph, is given kindness to him, gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. Watch the favor. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and in whatever he did, the Lord made him to prosper. He was running the estate, now he's running the jail. What you want in life is God's favor. You don't want the favor of man. You want God's favor. Isaiah 2.22, it says, Stop regarding man whose breath of life is in his nostrils, for why should he be esteemed? Don't worry about pleasing men who are utterly dependent on the Lord God. Please the Lord God. Please him. Please him. He rewards those who diligently seek him. Yeah, there might be a setback or two. Probably will be. But you put your life in God's hands and you do it his way. Psalm 75, not from the east nor from the west. Promotion comes not from the east or from the west or from the desert, but promotion comes from God. You let him promote you. Eventually, <laughs> you go on with Joseph, and he, runs, he winds up running the entire country of Egypt. Once again, God promotes him out of the jail in about 45 minutes, and now he's co-equal with Pharaoh in the greatest crisis in the world and he's co-ruling because he said no to adultery. I say this to say if you're in a situation where you're pondering it or where you're meeting some gal for lunch and there's an emotional attachment uh, and you say nothing's happened, yes, but it will happen. Go ahead and do what Jesus said. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your right hand offends you, cut it off. He's using hyperbole. He's talking about sexual immorality. He's been talking about marriage. Stay true to your marriage.
Second observation. And by the way, let me say this. We can't just leave it there. I said last week that we have guys in here that have been addicted to porn, but have been set free from that by the Lord Jesus Christ. They've gone through a process. I've met guys around the country who have ministries to guys to help them find their way out of porn addiction. What's interesting about those guys who lead those ministries is that every one of them was a slave to porn. But they were forgiven, they were washed, they were sanctified. And they got all in with the Lord, they confessed their sin, they were forgiven, and they began to grow. And now the comfort that they received from the Lord, they pass it on to others, for 2 Corinthians 1, and they fortify and strengthen other guys. That's how the Lord works. Same thing is true of adultery. God can forgive adultery. God will forgive adultery. If you turn from your sin, turn to him. There's genuine repentance. Uh, the, the vomiting of the soul, Thomas Watson called it. God forgives. Read Psalm 51. Because David committed adultery. Not only committed adultery, as you know, with Bathsheba, but wound up killing her husband to cover it up. And he covered it for a year. And if you read Psalm 51 and you read Psalm 32, you'll see his repentance. God restored him. There are those who have ministries to those who have been, who are in adultery and trying to put their marriage is back together. Why are they in that particular ministry? Because adultery occurred in their marriage. Yet Jesus broke through and repentance took place and reconciliation happened. And now, once again, <laughs> the Lord takes those who have failed and he begins to use them mightily in the lives of others. You see. Let's make the second observation on this seventh commandment. The second observation is simply that there is a battlefield of this commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Years ago, when I did this book, Point Man, I did a section, and I referred to this last week about being a one-woman kind of man. What the Lord wants for those of us who know him and are married, in 1 Timothy 3, the require, they gives the requirement for those who would be elders in the church, for men. It says, and right off the top, he must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. Literally, that is, he must be a one-woman kind of man. And our goal, whether or not you aspire to be an elder or not, as a Christian man, you desire to be a one-woman kind of man. And I went through it last week, just briefly. To be a one-woman kind of man with your mind. To be a one-woman kind of man with your eyes. To be um, a one-woman kind of man with your lips, with your speech. You don't say inappropriate things to women you're not married to. You don't make dirty jokes or innuendos. You don't do that. You're clean with your lips. You're a one-woman kind of a man with your hands. You're careful how you touch women. Um, you're just above reproach with women you're not married to. You're a one-woman kind of man with your feet. You see sexual immorality. You don't hang around and check it out. If you're in a museum and you see some porn somewhere and, you know, just, you know, hmm, I wonder what that really means. I wonder what the deeper meaning is. Yeah, it's, uh, it's filth. Get out of there. Flee immorality. You do different things to flee immorality. Sometimes uh, you might need to get on the bus. Gus. <laughs> Another situation, you might need to uh, drop off the key. Lee. 
Uh, or there could be another situation which will require you to make a new plan. Stan, thank you very much. <laughs> Let's stand and sing that together. <laughs> Paul Simon write that song. Yeah. It's good truth there. When we talk about the battlefield of this commandment, and let's stop for a minute here. Thou shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit adultery. Why? It protects marriage and protects trust in your marriage and protects your kids and gives them a model to follow and your grandkids, etc., etc. You see all the positives. We all know the negatives. When there's divorce and dad's not there and not present with the kids and... And then when marriage isn't there, and they're just cohabiting, and there's no real father figure, but whenever you've got that, the crime rate goes up. That's not a color issue, that's a heart issue. It's a violation of the commandment issue. You see? We, studies have been done, I, I think the enemy has in particularly in this country gone, off to, gone after the black community and the black family. Now, he does the same thing with the white family because we're right behind him. He's done the same thing in Scotland with all the Scots. You read, Scotland used to be the bulwark of Christianity in the Reformation under John Knox. Scotland is devastated morally because they've departed from the scriptures and there are small little house churches that are being started in Scotland, but whew, it's overwhelming. They've departed. The battlefield of, of uh, the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. And let me say this, the battlefield of porn, which leads to adultery, the battlefield is the mind. It's the mind. Allow me to read something here I wrote a while back. The major battlefield in spiritual warfare is the mind. The mind is the line of scrimmage in the Christian life, and whoever controls the line of scrimmage controls the game. The mind is where the enemy seeks to control us. If he can influence our minds, he can influence our behavior. It was Franklin Jones who wrote, what makes resisting temptation difficult for many people is that they don't want to discourage it completely. Think about that. What makes resisting temptation difficult for so many people is that they don't want to discourage it completely. Because, you see, there is some, it looks like there are some immediate benefits to sexual temptation. But you're not thinking clearly. The Apostle Paul had a different kind of outlook when he wrote in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have, our weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Watch this. We take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. He's talking about wrong philosophies, wrong teachings. One of the primary philosophies in our day is that there should be unbridled sexual anarchy and pleasure. Don't do anything to restrain my sexual activity. That is a philosophy. It is a teaching. It is of the devil. We are taking, watch this, we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. The battlefield is the mind. That's the battlefield. All kinds of sophisticated philosophies are out there. A man who wants to lead his family must learn to sift through the wrong ideas and take them to the obedience of Christ. Pastor Bill Hull writes that a man must know the Bible well enough through study to fight temptation and protect himself against the ideas and philosophies of the world. He is confronted daily with thousands of messages and ideas, and this is before the internet 
and smartphones. He wrote that back in the early 80s. <laughs> he is confronted daily with thousands or confronted daily with millions of messages and ideas. A biblical defense system must sort out the ideas, take what is obedient to Christ, and reject what isn't. So, under this, the battlefield, let's make two key points, which are really two key facts. Here's number one. Number one, you cannot keep wrong thoughts from coming into your mind. That's the first thing you gotta know. You can't keep temptation from coming into your mind. You can't keep wrong thoughts from coming into your mind. If you look at Matthew 4, Jesus was tempted by Satan with wrong thoughts. Now Jesus fought him off every time with the word of God. Every time Satan would tempt, Jesus would respond with the word of God. That gives me a tip. I'm not the brightest bulb on the earth. But it seems to me, if Jesus used scripture to fight off temptation, maybe I ought to be using scripture to fight off temptation. So you see, that tells me that there's, I know there's power in the word of God. So I want to have the word of God in my mind and heart so that I can fight off temptation when it comes. It's, but but it's, it's, it's important to understand, it's not a temptation, it's not sin to be tempted. It was C.S. Lewis who said, he who looks upon ham and eggs and lust has already committed breakfast in his heart. <laughs> Guy was one of a kind, wasn't he? Now, it's not sin to look at the ham and eggs. But you see, if you get into lust, ah, now you've committed breakfast. Um, so let's, let's take a look here at Matthew 6. We looked at this last week. If you have your Bible, turn with me. Actually, we're in Matthew 5, verse 27. You have heard it. You've heard, this is Jesus. 527, Matthew. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust, and the idea is with lustful intent to be with her, is the idea. Everyone who looks at a woman with lust, Lustful intent for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Uh, and as we said last week, that doesn't mean, well, okay, I've already committed in my heart, I might as well go ahead and do it. No, 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 that, no. No, that's, now you're really screwing up. That makes no sense. What Jesus is doing is taking this command beyond just behavior to the heart and to the intent. Flip over to, um, and, and this is where Jesus says in the next verse, if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out. He's using hyperbole. He's using extreme statements. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out. Throw it from you. It's better for you to lose one of your parts of body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. He's saying this is serious stuff. And serious stuff requires serious measures because your life is at stake here. Uh, flip over to James, if you would, uh, chapter one. Same idea. James tells us he's gonna talk about lust in James one, beginning with verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Thus, when lust has conceived, watch this, when lust is conceived, you can look, but when lust kicks in, 
You can look and say, wow, there's a beautiful girl, and she's a beautiful girl. All right? Just let it go. You say, well, I can't let it go. Sure you can. Well, I've never let it go. I see a beautiful girl, and I can't stop. You've got to train yourself. You've got to train yourself for righteousness. Well, I don't know what to do. Well, you put the Word of God in your heart, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures inspired by God. We talked about this last Sunday. And profitable for teaching. I got to get right truth in my heart and mind. It's profitable for teaching, reproof. When I get off, God reproves me, but he doesn't leave me there. He'll also use scripture to correct me. And it's profitable for training in righteousness. We have to be trained. If, if, you got to start somewhere. Before you can run a marathon, you got to get a lap around the high school track without vomiting. Right? You're not going to do something great overnight. You take little steps. And the same thing is with sexual temptation. May uh, uh, I suggest something to you? So if you, Lord, I want to do this. I, I mean, it's hard for me. I see a pretty girl, and man, my mind just takes off. All right? Can I, let me give you a suggestion. Very practical. The next time you see a pretty girl walking by, you see her, okay? And then you're starting to th think wrongly, pray for her. Just pray for her. You can't pray for her and lust after her at the same time. Just pray for her in your heart. Lord Jesus, I don't know her. I don't know her situation in life. But I pray that if she doesn't know you, that you would draw her to come to know you and she'd have a relationship with you. I pray that if she's married, you would bless her and her husband and their marriage and children. If she's obviously not married, I would pray that she, God would bless her in her marriage. And you start praying for her, like you'd pray for somebody you love. And I'm going to tell you something. You're going you're, you're to throw a fire extinguisher on that lust. Right? But you got to grab it and you got to take control. Okay. When lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So you don't want to go down that road. We've all been down that road. I want to nip it in the bud. So I got to get aggressive. But I got to be trained. I'm not going to get it overnight. It's like when President Reagan walked out of that Hilton Hotel. We've all seen the video. The shots ring out. What happens when shots ring out? What's the natural reaction? Boom, you hit the deck. Everybody hit the deck. The vantage point, you can see that Secret Service agent over there on the, on the right. And he's standing there, and there are other agents, but you can only see this guy in the, in the clips I saw. And he's standing there, just looking, you know. Shots ring out, pop, pop. And I went back, and you can see this on YouTube, and you, and you saw it down, and here's what you see. You, you see the, the, the shots ring out, and you see his eyes go like that, and he starts to dip, because that's the natural reaction. And then his training takes over. Everybody else is on the deck. He's going like this, starting to dip, and then the training kicks in. He doesn't go down. He actually goes against his natural instincts, and he turns towards the shot. Boom! Takes the shot. That's training. That's years of training. That's what we got to do. So the first fact is you cannot keep wrong thoughts from coming into your mind. Second key fact. This is critical, guys. When you are sexually tempted, you must aggressively attack. When you are sexually tempted, you must aggressively attack. And I think here's a mindset that happens to Christian men. I think what happens is we have lulled ourselves into passivity when it comes to sexual temptation. We're hit with it all the time. And I mean, it's just a, a never-ending barrage. And I mean, you know, you, you get battle fatigue. Uh, you, you can't stop fighting. You cannot get passive. I, I'm, I've talked to guys, met guys who are aggressive and are courageous and all that good stuff. 
comes to sexual, sexual temptation, it's like they, they turn into the Pillsbury Doughboy. Get that picture in your mind. You've seen that commercial, right? Little guy, white all over, made up of just dough. <laughs> He's just a jolly little guy. You can't be the Pillsbury Doughboy. You're up against Satan and his demons. You got to get aggressive. You get sexually tempted. You ever seen the NFL video on Dick Butkus? I mean, the legendary linebacker for the Bears back in what? 70s, 80s? I mean, you got to watch that. But kiss. I mean, he was crazy. He's in the Hall of Fame, but he was nuts. But because you watch some of that footage, he played for the Bears, Soldier Field. It's 10 degrees, it's the fourth quarter. He's got snot frozen on his face. He's got blood coming off here. He's got, I mean, and, and you know, Steelers offensive line, and he's right up there. He's going to blitz. He's right there. Here's the center and guard, and he's going to blitz. He's coming in there, and they're going to stop him. And he's watching it, and he's going to, he's spitting. He's just, I mean, he's coming after him, and all of a sudden, hut, hut, boom, and he, pow, hits that sucker right in the chops, nails the guard, steps in. Here comes a fullback. They used to have fullbacks. He knocks that sucker right in the chops, and then here comes the running back, grabs the sucker by the face mat, gets him down, Kicks him in the, I believe the biblical term is the gonads. <laughs> Gets him down, punches him in the gut, spits on him, gets up, and goes back to the huddle. That's how you got to be with sexual temptation. Somebody asked Butkus one time, would you ever purposely hurt another player? He said, no, no, of course not. I, I mean, unless it was a playoff game. <laughs> now, I grant you that's extreme. But if you're going to err, err there, instead of Pillsbury Doughboy. You've got to step in. When you're tempted, you've got to step in and you've got to, boom, hit that sucker. Jesus, help me right now. There's so much at stake here. You're on the road, you're traveling, you walk into that hotel room, you better have a game plan. You better have a game plan. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it's God who is at work within you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You say, Steve, you're kind of extreme on that butkus thing. You think? Let me show you something real quick. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Now, that's how the New American Standard Bible reads. Other translations read this way. Watch this. Therefore, put to death the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality impurity, passion, evil desire and greed which amounts to idolatry um, check out if you would uh, Romans 8.13 same idea but I think I want to start in 7 just because we relate to seven, uh, verse 15. I'm going to start in 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. Yes, it is. But I am of the flesh. The flesh is not your skin. The flesh is that when we come to know Christ, sin used to be this giant Hercules monster that dominated our lives and was our master, and we had to follow what he said. When Jesus comes into our lives, now he's our Lord and Master. The Holy Spirit lives within us. The Holy Spirit. Now, we still have the flesh, that old sin nature. 
but it is, it's not a master, it's not a giant. It's a decrepit old, 100-year-old man in a wheelchair with IVs hanging out of his arm. He, he can't see, he has no teeth, and uh, he's just barely alive. But he's there. Okay? That old man's there. But Jesus is Lord. 15. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. Boy, that sounds familiar to me. I'm, I, I relate to this. If you struggle with porn, you relate to this. Jesus, help me to get out of this. Help me to get out of it. And you're still in it. Uh, look at 19. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil I don't want. 21. I find the principle that evil is present in me. Yeah, that old man is still there. What do I do? Uh, 24. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of this, from the body of this death? Romans 8. Look at the next chapter. Verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the Savior. You confess your sin. You say, oh, I can't ask him again. I failed so many times. Go to him. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He'll never turn you away. But what you want to begin doing is to learn how to kill sin. The old Puritan pastors 300 years ago they wrote books on the mortification of the flesh. When I read that passage in Colossians and the one I just read in Romans, the King James will, will talk about the mortification. Uh, put it to death. They would mortify, say mortify the flesh. It means to kill it. Uh, G.I. Packer did a book called God's Words. He has a section here on the word mortify. Now, this is real quick, all right? It's one paragraph. The Christian is committed to a lifelong fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Mortification, killing sin, is his assault on the second, the flesh, the sin nature within you after you're a Christian. He quotes Colossians 3, 5, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And then Romans eight thirteen, if by the spirit, did I read Romans eight thirteen? Maybe that would be a good idea. If by the Spirit ye mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. In the New American Standard, it reads this way. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So, we got to kill sin. And you don't do that being a Pillsbury Doughboy. You do that by being a butkus. And you, you're coming in, you're kicking tail. You're fighting. And you're going to kill it. John Owen, the great Puritan, said, either we be killing sin or sin be killing us. All right, half a paragraph. He's going to give a little Greek here. Don't fall asleep on me. This is significant. Okay, there'll be a test later. The verb in the second text, the Romans text, is in the present tense, implying that killing sin, mortification, must be continuous. If you keep on mortifying, you shall live. So it's going to be a continual battle until we go to be with Jesus. The verb in the first is the aorist tense, implying that mortification, once commenced, will be successfully accomplished. God will help you. Will it happen overnight? Will it happen next Thursday? Will it happen by next Saturday? No. It's a long obedience in the same direction. But you don't quit fighting. So let me give you a personal clarification here because I'm out of time. Let's wrap this up. And last week I talked about the importance at the end of how do you break this? How do you break this? How do you break this cycle of because you're ashamed, you don't want anybody to know about it. 
But James 5 says, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. There are some sins, as I said last week, you cannot break by yourself. So what you have to do is you have to go, and I'm repeating myself, but it needs to be said. If you want to break this, God will help you, but you're going to have to confess your sin to a trusted brother in Christ, I trusted, that you know will keep his mouth shut. This is between you two. You say, I can't go to him. He'll reject me. I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed. Sure, you're ashamed. He's not going to turn you down. He's not going to reject you. Not if he's a mature believer because he's got his own stuff. He probably had the same stuff you've had. And you go and just put it on the table. Listen, I struggle with pornography and I just can't get my way out of this thing. And I'm just being honest with you. And gosh, you know what? He's not going to turn you away. He goes, man, thanks for having the guts, the courage for being so honest. Let's, let's walk through this together. Galatians uh, 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. So you confess it to a brother and you pray for one another and then you take some other steps. Um, first, you've got to come clean. And then um, you've got to be accountable. And you, you start meeting one, you start meeting with each other, uh, and, and you start asking each other questions each week. Are you looking at any stuff, or are you, how are your finances? Are you missing around on your tax returns, or are you being straight? And see, you're looking out for each other, and you're helping each other. We're lifting each other up. And then you get on a deal like Covenant Eyes, and you put it on your devices, and he gets it on his, and you get a report at the end of the month on every website you've been on and every one he's been on. And I said it last week, you, you, your phone, your wife ought to be able to look at your history anytime she wants. Your kids. Hey, Dad, let me look at your history. Here you go. Say, man, I, I don't think I could do that right now. Well, maybe not right now. But, you know, Jesus can make a huge change in the next 90 days. I want to clarify, because last week when I finished, I was talking about this stuff in particular, and I said something to the fact that we've all struggled with this, I've struggled with this over the years, and someone asked me afterwards, later, they said, so Steve, you've been, man, I didn't realize you've been looking at porn, you know, how many years you've been married? I said, 42 years. You've been looking at porn for 42 years? I said, no. Oh, I thought that's what you meant. No, I mean, by God's grace, I haven't. I mean, I, I've struggled. I'm, I mean, sexual temptation never goes away. Ever. And by God's grace and mercy, you can grow in grace. And there is a freedom that Christ will give you and a power to overcome sin. <laughs> It doesn't make you proud, it makes you humble. Let him who stands take heed lest he fall. Let not the foot of pride come upon me. This is, if God's been gracious, if, you're, if you've struggled with alcohol and you've been clean for nine years, you're not proud, you're thankful, right? Yeah, but see, he gives a greater grace and we can mature and we can develop a track record. So, so let me just personally tell you a little, my, my, i tell you my journey a little bit. So I, you know, hey, when I grew up, there was no internet. There were no cars. No, that's not right. There were cars. Um, <laughs> there was no internet. If you wanted to look at porn, you had to go somewhere. You had to go on the wrong side of town to some porn shop at 3 a.m., you didn't want anybody seeing you. If anybody saw you, you'd be shamed. Boy, that's changed. I can remember, um, I, I can remember someone leaving in a dorm room or something, a Playboy, and, you know, wow, look at that. And then I immediately felt terrible. Uh, that didn't happen all the time. It was just, but it happened. Um, it, 
the temptation, I, I want to say this, we're living in days of exceptional evil for our kids and us and grandkids. It is beyond evil. It's beyond evil. I, I didn't live in a culture like that. But did I get tempted here and there? Yeah. Did I sin? Yeah. By God's grace, I prayed that the Lord would help me to obey the scripture. I wanted to be sexually pure when I got married, and by his grace, I was. And it was a sure grace. I don't say that proudly. It was the goodness of God. I thank him for that. Um, and I wanted to grow in grace. And I wanted to mature. Um, But the struggle is always there and the temptation is always there. I had something happen to me my rookie year as a pastor. Um, I was meeting with some guys in a small group Bible study and uh, we met every week. And one night after the study, I went to meet with a guy in a coffee shop and it was real cold that night, really exceptionally cold for California. And uh, we went in there, and it was about 9 o'clock, and the waitress comes up and says, coffee? And he said, yeah. And I, I did not drink coffee. until I, I never started drinking coffee until I was 50. And I was, what, 28? I was so cold. I said, yeah, I'll have a cup of coffee. And so she gave me coffee. I get cream. I get about a gallon of cream and a bunch of sugar, and, you know, you can't taste the coffee. And I'm sitting there sipping it. And we're talking, you know. She comes back, you want more coffee? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had about three cups of coffee. I went home, and I'm wide-eyed. I can't sleep. I watched Carson. I watched Letterman. I watched that Tom Weird guy, if you remember him, Snyder. I mean, I, I mean it's 2.30 in the morning. I'm wide awake. I mean, I'm ready to go to work. I read everything in the house. I mean, I cannot go to sleep. I am wired. About 3 o'clock, I just got up. I got in the car, and I went down to the 7-Eleven, I thought maybe, you know, there's a time or Newsweek, they used to have these magazines you'd read. And I, and I, I'm, there's nobody in there, it's just me. And I, I'm in there and I find myself looking at a Playboy magazine. Now I'm a young rookie pastor, I'm married, and I got a little girl on the way. And I was about 10 seconds doing that and I went, what the heck am I doing? I was ashamed. I was guilty. I was embarrassed. I got out of there as fast as I could. And the next morning, I told Mary what happened. I said, hey, I want to tell you what, what I did last night. Did I want to tell her? No. Did I need to tell her? Yes. Because I didn't want any secrets. I didn't want any hidden sin. I didn't want the enemy to get in between us. I had to come clean. I had to confess my sin one to another to Mary. And she was great about it. She really was. But then I had to preach on Sunday. And whatever text I was doing had something to do with telling the truth. And I'm about halfway into that message. In that little church in Foster City, California, and I said, Well, I got to come clean. And I told them what happened. And people were wonderful and very gracious to me. But I'll tell you what, I never wanted to go through that again. I have a tremendous fear of getting up and teaching something which I am not actively trying to apply to my life. It scares me to death. So I confessed it. And I thought, I never want to do that again. And that has that fear. <laughs> and that fear of the Lord has, by God's grace, been... He's used it. I'm sexually tempted every day, as you are. You, how can you not be in this culture? 
but you learn to develop holy habits. You learn and you begin to practice looking away and praying for her instead of lusting. And, and you know, you get a lap around the high school track. And then you get a 440 in without vomiting. And then maybe you get two laps. And then you guys get what I'm saying? God will enable us to grow. And he's a forgiver of sin. And David, a man after God's own heart, when he fell and repented with all of his heart, he was forgiven. And he said, create in me a clean heart. And God did. Be encouraged, guys. You're not alone in this battle. But we've got to take some steps. Because we can't fight it by ourselves. So, Father, we come to you. Thank you for grace and mercy and forgiveness. We don't want to play games. And we don't want to be held by Satan's devices. We would like to be free. And we can be free. But we have to be willing to confess our sins and make ourselves accountable. And then, Lord, you see that, and you will walk with us, and you will help us, and you will supply us with more grace and more mercy and more favor. And when we fall down, you don't throw us out of the family. You pick us up, you brush us off, and you put us back in the race again as we confess our sin. What a great Savior you are. Help us with this, we pray. In Jesus' name.